I am Brooke Smith, the Director of Public Engagement with Science at the Kavli Foundation, and joined here with my colleague Rick Borschelt from the Department of Energy and our speakers. And Rick and I just wanted to say a few words to welcome you all and set the context for our really exciting conversation today. So this webinar is hosted by the Science and Public Engagement Partnership or SIPEP, which is a partnership of the Kavli Foundation at the Department of Energy. And we wanted to provide a bit of context. SIPEP um, generally, let me just share a bit about that. It's a new endeavor. We just launched it this past year. And our ultimate goal as we work together, the Kavli Foundation and DOE in partnership is to empower scientists who do basic research and the professionals who support communications about basic research and engagement about basic research to ensure that their work, their practices can be done as effectively as possible. And really one of the core emphasis here for Kavli and the DOE is that we are focusing this again on basic research, fundamental discovery research, curiosity driven research. Uh, we often say when people ask us to define basic research, we find it's easier to define it with what it's not. It's not applied research. And we've really noticed through the years and as we've seen a burgeoning in uh, scholarship and interest in engaging the public in science, that a lot of the discussions are either about science generally or often examples that are given about how to meaningfully engage people in science, um, to effectively engage or communicate in science, tend to be about applied research. Uh, and that makes a lot of sense because a lot of the lessons and best practices in engaging people in science is really grounded in ensuring it's relevant to people's lives, um, <clears throat> that it's part of their, their daily life, things that they care about. And with that, we tend to focus our examples on things like health or environment. And while that's important, for those of us who do basic research, care about basic research, fund basic research, we've started to ask some questions about, is this scholarship and best practices that we're coming up with as relevant to basic research? And so we wanted to ask that question and have a community conversation about that over the next few years. In order to um, think about what we know about that, to start laying a groundwork for that, we thought it was going to be really important to also first think about what do we know about the scholar, what the scholarship says, what, what is in the scholarship about science communication and public engagement that is specific to basic research. And so that's where this webinar comes into play. Uh, this is a precursor to our larger conference next week. And one of my colleagues on the DOE team, Natalie, will stick a link in the chat right now. Um, I assume many of you are familiar with our conference. That might be why you came to us today. But next week, we will have a larger conference to explore all of these issues. To prepare for that, we asked uh, two leading social scientists who I'll introduce in a moment, Todd and John, to do a bit of a landscape survey and study to dig into what we understand so that we could enter that conference in an informed way and have conversations about that. So I'll talk a little bit more about what John and Todd are doing and are um, have done for us, but I wanna turn it over to my colleague Rick to say a few words about the conference next week and what SIPEP is up to. Rick? Hey everybody, thanks so much for joining us today. It really is terrific seeing a, so many great uh, friends uh, from the past and recent in the chat today and from all over the place and not just uh, you know, not just the, the normal spots we normally see people coming in for our conferences from. So thanks a million, Brooke, and, and thanks for all the support from Kavli for SIPEP in, initiative in general, uh, which is gonna go on for another couple of years and for which this, is, uh, this and the conference is a precursor. And for this deep dive into the science communication scholarship in particular, it's really important to me, as it is, I suspect, to many of us, even though sometimes we don't get a chance to talk about this as much as we do, you know, jumping into the particulars of what we're doing and what particular kinds of science communication. So when we first began to plan this conference over a year ago now, um, and this conference has, I just have to say, more than 1,700 registrants already. Um, and that's, uh, and we hope you're on that list because it's, uh, it's, you know, it's, it's going to be the place to be next week if you're in science communication at all. Um, and I'm really shocked, shocked, awed, excited um, that we're going to have these conversations with so many people who are very interested in the engagement around basic science. Uh, we wanted to get some sense uh, before we ran that conference about what 
what the scholarship told us had been done in that communication space already around basic science. And we'd sort of planned sort of a, what I consider a gap analysis that we might use to inform the agenda for the conference and figure out which kinds of speakers we needed to fit into that conference. And, and it did that. We just didn't realize it would be such a big gap to analyze, as you're going to hear in a little bit uh, from our speakers. But that's exactly why it's important to do this kind of fundamental social science research before embarking on something like this conference, to inform the community conversation, certainly, and to inform practice as people uh, sort of incorporate this into their worldview. And, it, and it's important to know what kind of social science research is being done about public engagement in basic science. You always start with what you don't know, but wish you did. And there's a lot of that to unpack. Or you kick the tires on what you think you know, and whether it's based on evidence for the goals you want to achieve. And I think that's going to be something that our presenters today are really going to help us do. And as Brooke and I, as Brooke noted, she and I and many others here today and in the communication, public engagement community in general have observed for some time now that every time we walk into conversations like this in other meetings or other conferences or other dialogues, the conversation pivots so quickly, it takes your breath away to something applied. Vaccine hesitancy, climate denial, or other hot button social issues in science and technology. It's not that we don't value basic science, and maybe it's because we think basic science sort of takes care of itself already and doesn't really need the extra boost. But God knows we don't get a chance to talk about the, you know, the, the basic understanding of, of uh, engagement in basic science. We don't talk much about how to engage people around basic research. And without being able to put our finger on it exactly, we, we figured something was different. At least that's been our thinking all along is that something's different about basic science communication and basic science engagement that isn't true of the rest of the world of science engagement. It doesn't quite fit the communication models and practices we use for science communication more broadly. I don't know whether that's true or not. And that's one of the reasons why we asked our teams uh, today to talk to us. So like any good scientist, the first place we went to start was with a survey of the landscape, and that's what you're going to hear today. Uh, for those of you who follow such things, and, and a good proportion of you in the audience do, you know there's a huge and growing literature in science communication. And, and sifting through that, a uh, uh, Herculean the um, feat, and I'm really, really pleased with the results of this deep dive uh, has provided to us and the hard work that the teams put into it and finding this thread of basic science engagement in the larger research literature. And that's what the work you're gonna to hear today is really sets us up well for many sessions in the conference next week. Um, and then where we've talked John and Todd and a number of other communication scholars to share with us sort of their perspectives, both from this research and their own backgrounds uh, about basic science and its engagement and how to encourage scientists and the public to engage together around it. And we decided to do this sort of extended discussion with on the work that they've done as a pre-conference webinar, because it will give those of us who really care about the science communication research literature to better prepare for the questions and conversations we're going to have during the conference, which will have a lot of other uh, aspects to it as well. And I hope and expect there will be many, many questions and many, many conversations. Brooke, thanks and back to you. Yeah. Thanks, Rick. Okay, well, without further ado, let's dig in. So we've got John Besley and Todd Newman, two social science scholar experts who, uh, for those of you who work in science communication, I'm sure you know their names or know them or have hopefully had the chance to interact with them. Um, the two of them took on this work uh, with their teams, and we're going to hear first from John. So John is the Ellis Brandt Professor of Public Relations at Michigan State. He studies public opinion about science and scientists' opinion about the public, always in the context of trying to help science communication be more strategic. And then we'll hear a bit from Todd, Todd Newman, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Life Sciences Communication at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He's an affiliate of the Holt Center for Science and Technology Studies there and the Nelson Institute for Environmental Studies. And his research focuses on the role of strategic communication within the context of science and technology. So they have been a great pair to tackle this challenge. Uh, John is gonna share some uh, slides and remarks about what uh, he found. We'll pause for some questions, which you can put in the chat. 
Then we'll hear from Todd, and then we'll have time for Q&A and discussion with the group at the end of the call. Uh, we'll be monitoring the chat throughout their presentation. So if you have a thought or a reaction or a question, we'll try to catch that. Um, I'm sure you'll have more questions than we can get to. We'll try our best to triage, combine, and also next week at the conference, we have lots of sessions and brainstorming sessions to dig into this much more. So this is meant to be our, um, our little appetizer before next week. So have no fear if we can't get in today, come next week. Okay, over to you, John. Great. All right, hopefully I have just shared my screen. And um, yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, Brooke. Thank you, Rick. Thank you to the DOE and Cavalier teams. Um, Excited to be able to share this with you, uh, share this work with you with my, uh, on behalf of my colleagues, Karen Peterman, as well as Jane Robertson and, and uh, Alison Blackmire. They, you know, uh, any of the mistakes I make are totally my fault. Uh, some of the, we had to make a bunch of choices as we went through these and, and uh, the, the, the silly choices were probably my silly choices, but uh, I'm still gonna share, I'm excited to share them with you nonetheless. And as I understand it, as Rick, Rick talked about, this real, the thing that I think is underlying this is this question of, is there an evidence-based literature? If I'm a, somebody in basic science, is there an evidence-based literature that I could use to make decisions? And I have to, I went into this with sort of the idea of, I didn't, I mean, I feel like I'm pretty familiar with the literature. And when I thought about like, is there a separate basic science communication literature? I didn't really think there was, but I tried to go into it with an open mind. And um, yeah, and then I think, I have some views about it. I feel like my views now are a little, little better informed. Um, so my piece of the puzzle, Todd's gonna go broad. I'm gonna stay a little bit more narrow. Um, so I really focused in on, for the most part, these four journals, which I think of as being the core science communication journals. Um, science communication, public understanding of science, journal of science communication, and the most new, the newest one, which is the international journal. You can read it, it's a very long title. Um, and I'm gonna argue that essentially if, a basic science, my first sort of, the first key choice is, is to focusing on these four journals. And the argument is that if there is a basic science communication literature, it should at least partly exist within these four journals. Um, and so that's where we're gonna go, we're gonna go look at, we're gonna go hunting. Um, in terms of um, the rationale, part, just to sort of bolster the rationale for that, like let's just take the term public engagement as a, a thing we might be interested in. Um, and you can say, well, where did, if we go into web of science and we say, well, where did the term public engagement get used as a sort of a complete term? Uh, what you find is of course, the top four of the top five are those four journals. The fourth one, or the fifth, fourth one is actually pl plus one um, and debated whether or not we should include, you know, any article that mentioned plus public engagement or science communication in plus one, but ultimately, um, it's about 50 articles. We decided to, to, to focus in really on these four for journals because we think that. Now, the first thing is that, well, let's just look for the term basic science in sort of the, the key data for these articles. And it turns out in the, across those four articles, in the, in the titles or abstracts, at least on web of science, that term basic science seems to have appeared once um, in this article, which isn't really about basic science, as far as I can tell. Um, it just happens to be in the keywords as very aggressive keyword strategy for this article. Uh, and so it, 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 it's there, but it's, it's not a, especially what I would think of as an article about basic science. So we can't just search for, for basic science. So, we, so the next step we had to do is we had to think about, well, how are we gonna find, short of reading the sort of 2,400 articles that are there, we did spend a lot of time reading articles, but uh, both in the lead up and, and as part of the whole process, but short of just reading all 2,400 articles or all 2,400 abstracts, we just didn't have the time for that. And, and it's more resource intensive than I think makes sense. Um, we had this conversation with Todd's team, with our team and with the, um, the, the, some of the folks in the, the steering committee for the SIPEP conference trying to think, well, what are some of the keywords? What are keywords that we think exemplify basic science. And we came up with this list on, on the left. That was our ultimate list that we decided on. And if you notice the thing, those are a lot of the things that Cavalry and DOE focus in on. And then we are, there's two steps to this process. First, um, we just sort of pulled the articles that had those keywords. And an article could have more than one keyword. Um, but then we did human coding. And whenever we did human coding, we're pretty, we pretty, think we're pretty careful in, in about this. We always did, we did some training on sort of a subset. We then um, to get and sort of find, getting the coding instrument set up. And then we sort of gave, it was, it was Allison and, um, and Jane 
where the coders, they didn't know it was being double coded at the end. Once we finished out, got the coding thing, they didn't know it was being double coded. And so we randomly, uh, and about uh, a subset of the, the data was randomly coded. And this first question was just like, yeah, the word, a keyword appeared in the abstract, but was, was it really an article about basic science? And what we ended up shrink doing is shrinking from about 237 articles, maybe 10%, of that, all the articles that ever been in those four journals down to maybe about 7%. We lost a lot of word articles that use the word evolution, um, for example, because people use the word evolution a lot. Um, we lost, um, what are the other things we lost? We lost some of the chemistry ones. They might, there were some articles that were, you know, the word chemistry might appear in a list of, of topics. Uh, that, so that it wasn't really an article about chemistry or substantively about chemistry, but we lost, we ended, ended up losing and so we think maybe there's about 171 articles of those 2,400 that are potentially about basic science. The biggest group of that, noticeably, is nanotech. And that's actually one we debated whether or not we should include as a basic science or an applied science. The technology thing, on one hand, to me, says applied. But we also know how important nanotech is to, to DOE, to Cavley. And so we, we ultimately included it. But it would be pretty easy. You could just pop up those 60, and we're down to 100. Um, about 100 articles. Uh, but yeah, so that's our first step. So we think maybe there's like 7% or at least somewhat about basic science. Uh, if you're just curious, these are the, some of the other words that appeared a lot, obviously on, on Brooke's point about the literature being super applied. Yeah, technology, policy, um, those are right at the top. Risks, which is a pretty applied concept right at the top. Um, a lot of these words are um, very much risk oriented or sorry, uh, applied work. And these are the words that most commonly appeared in, in the journal articles. Uh, the next thing we did, the next step, the sort of step three to our process was, well, let's think about, if we go back to our original question, right, which was, is there an evidence-based, um, evidence base for people in basic science communication that they could draw on, we wanted to get to, well, let's think about what are the quantity, what are the methods used? Um, and so really we're interested in pulling out what are the articles that included quantitative data, qualitative data, qualitative data, and to some extent case study data? Though our and um, the actual report has the exact wordings for our coding categories. But again, human coding um, blind. The, the coders didn't know it was being double coded to make sure that they weren't sort of trying harder on those ones. Um, we do that. We get down to a five percent of the articles we think have either quantitative, qualitative, or case study data. The rest, the other. 2% are either content analysis, which it's a bit tricky, I would think, to use content. I think of content analysis being a bit tricky to use for making decisions. I think historical stuff a little bit less. And then pure theoretical, which would include philosophical arguments um, as well as, um, yeah, uh, but sort of articles that didn't include data in a substantive way. For this stage, I might also add that we actually pulled the full art. We were initially working with just the, the abstracts, keywords, um, titles. For this one, we actually pulled the full 161 articles. So that the, the, and so that took a long time to go through. And it's like, does this have real data? Does this have data we could really use? Um, and we were pretty generous, but we were able to, to get um, a pretty good sense of that. And some data, some articles, again, could have multiple types of um, content. So they could have done a survey and some interviews, for example. Um, so that's, that's, a, that's step through. So we're still sort of in a quantitative approach. And now we're going to get a little bit qualitative. Um, and I need to clarify some words because the kind of words that I like to use, um, you know, I think it's in introduction, I'm increasingly interested in strategy. And I find words related to strategy really helpful for talking about some of these things. And so I'm going to use words like, I'm going to use, I'm going to differentiate three types of, of content. Goals, which I think of as being behavior-like outcomes, that's your, we're trying to get funding, we're trying to get support, we're trying to get acceptance or legitimacy, we're trying to change scientists' research choices, we're trying to build long-term relationships. That's a little bit, that last one's a little fuzzy, but you can also think of that as behavioral trust, a willingness when we have long-term relationships, we're willing to make ourselves vulnerable. But the key is that there, when I use the term goals, I mean like long-term outcomes and things that don't happen directly because of communication. Communication objectives, on the other hand, when I talk about objectives in the next few slides, I mean individual level outcomes. And these are the types of things you see in things like the theory of planned behavior. Attitudes, which are really evaluative beliefs about risks and benefits, normative beliefs, um, self-efficacy beliefs, trust-related beliefs, like integrity beliefs, uh, 
uh, competence beliefs, caring, caring or benevolence beliefs, um, those types of beliefs, but as well as feelings or emotions, you know, somebody could, I can do a communi do, do communication that makes people angry, that can make people feel awe, that can make people feel interest. So that's what I mean by objectives, things that can happen directly, what makes sense to happen directly because of communication. And then the activities or tactics, those are just, you know, the message, the behavior. How do I set up the room? What tone do I use? Um, what, what do I say? What specific words do I say? Do I do it in a narrative or do I do it more didactically? Am I humorous? Am I serious? Where do I do it? What channel? So those are just the terms I'm using here. And if you, in our sort of approach, those are great. Having that differentiation is really helpful when you're thinking about setting strategy at the front end, but also evaluating at the back end. Um, and if you're interested in that, you can Google Scholar. I mean, lots of places where you've written about that. Um, as a practical matter, what it meant is we went again, we have the article, all the, the abstracts in vivo. I'm going through it now looking for, does the abstract mention a goal, does, or the title or the keywords mention a goal? Does it mention something that would fit in the sort of that space of an of a objective? Does it describe some sort of a tactic or activity? If it's a survey project, when I say goal, it'd be like, what's the dependent variable? Is the dependent variable what I would think of as a goal? Or is the activity like might be media use? There was lots of studies, for example, a number of studies where essentially looking at the correlation between media use and some other short or long-term outcome. And what ultimately what we find is most of the articles, most of those sort of hundred articles that are quantitative, qualitative, or case studies, they're about an event or an activity or an exhibit or a media use. Um, that's, that's not super surprising. The more interesting thing I think is the, and then we said, and I think this is consistent with lots of things that I hear when we've done interviews with, for example, trainers. There's this near exclusive focus on essentially a, hand, a very a short, short pantry of objectives. Um, lots of articles, but the most common one, but I think about four and 10, the report has the exact numbers, but of those, the biggest, the most common objective is something about learning, knowledge. Do they know some fact about science? Did they learn something about a scientific study or a scientific concept or a construct? That's the primary objective. That's more than anything else. And then maybe risk benefit beliefs, especially in the nanotech articles. And then, um, especially, and I'll talk about astronomy in a second, um, especially uh, feelings. Did they have experience, awe, interest? Um, not a lot, mostly positive feelings. So that they, they had some activity, did that activity lead to positive feelings? But if you go back to like the, the list of objectives that we could have, wasn't much about, almost nothing about trust related objectives, almost nothing about self efficacy related objectives, nothing about norm, normative beliefs. There's lots of, all, the point is there's where it seemed that the literature that does exist seems to focus in on a pretty narrow set of potential communication objectives. And, almost, and then on, when it comes to actual goals, the things when I'm doing interviews with scientists and they say, well, I want to increase knowledge or decrease misinformation and I push back, but why? What do you hope will happen if you increase knowledge or decrease misinformation or get people excited? Those long-term goals, very little of this literature talks about that. A little bit about STEM career choice, a little bit about support, again, especially in the nanotech stuff where it's around funding, but very limited clarity about why are we trying to affect knowledge? Why are we trying to affect interest? Why are we trying to? Um, and so very little discussion in those sort of about 100 articles we had left on what the goal was. Um, we're interested in public engagement. We're interested in two-way communication. I will emphasize it was always about everything. We're almost every, I should say, almost everything we saw was about effects on audiences other than scientists. We didn't see situations when I think of, um, Two-way communication, I think, do we study, did a scientist's beliefs, trustworthiness beliefs, normative beliefs, self-efficacy beliefs, um, knowledge change? Did they change their behavior? Did they change their research path? Nothing, very little in this, almost nothing about um, scientists being the, sort of the focal point of people who might change as a result of communication. Um, pretty similar, if we did, if we did, and when the fifth step is we, we like, well, let's go even deeper. And then this is the one place where we went beyond those four core journals. Let's pick two topics that are particularly interested to this community, um, astronomy and uh, neuroscience. Um, I also got to share some of this stuff with uh, the communicating astronomy folks. It was well-timed. And you see that they're pretty similar to the broader picture that we see in the four core journals, but there's some little sort of interesting variations in those, in those spaces. For example, the, for example, the astronomy people, 
as you might imagine, are very interested in images and emotions. And so you see a little bit more of that when you sort of build out into that space. The neuroscience people have this really interesting debate about the misuse of neuroscience of brain images. And so you see a little bit of that that's sort of special to the neuroscience. But more generally, it's the same thing. Lots of focus on knowledge, focus on positive emotions, not a lot of focus on the full, what I would think of as a full pantry of potential communication objectives. Which gets us to where I think, where I think if, if I was, and I am to some extent in some of my projects thinking, working with basic scientists, to me, the core is if you, can, if you don't know what you're trying to achieve, if you don't know what your long-term goal is, if you're trying to make sure that the public supports robust funding for basic science, if you're trying to get people, diverse range of folks to go into STEM careers, where you have those clear goals, it's really hard to think about stuff. And I think there's some goals that make sense. I think one thing that's interesting in the basic science thing is the goals are gonna be a little more broad. They're gonna be about career choice or funding, but also about the overall relationship between scientists and society. They're gonna be about, they're not gonna be about get this person to take this vaccine. And so thinking about what are the discrete goals or the, the, the relevant goals for that community. And then that leads you to the sort of the other stuff. Like, well, now once we figured out if we can have that discussion in the basic science community, community about what your goals are, now we can start thinking about, are we using all the ingredients, all the communication objectives that are really at the core of most theories? You know, theories are built up of all these sort of different discrete, what I would think of as objectives leading to the final outcome. We can do that. And then we can get to the point where we say, well, what tactics do we need to really dive into? And just does this tactic lead to this objective? If we, we prioritize an objective, now we can start really focusing on on prioritizing tactics, activities that we want to test. That's where I'm at now. So this, I'm having in my other research, having these conversations with scientists about the goals, hopefully as a way to, um, as my bio sort of, as, as, as um, Brooke talked about in the bio, as a way to um, help, help the community communicate strategically. And I will stop there and thank you very much for letting me share this. Thanks, John. Uh, before we go to Todd, I see um, one question that a number of folks have plus one. Have you looked at or would you consider looking at teaching and learning journals as part of your landscape? So not so I would. I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting as a as a as a question. And, and I think there's an interesting question of are teaching learning journals substantively different than communication journals? We've done this a little bit in some task force work, task force work with um, uh, case folks, uh, and there is definitely some differences. Um, but I think our charge in this case is what's the communication literature. And again, if you look at that public engagement thing that, that out the front end, that's where the discussion of public engagement, teaching journals weren't coming out. I think learning teaching journals tend to focus a lot on learning outcomes, but of course they also self-efficacy is huge. Um, identity is huge, I know, in that, in that, that space. Um, I'd be curious to know if we would get a different, different set of things. Other interesting thing, I think one of the discussions about how communication is different from maybe some educational learning is that goal bit, right? Whereas in education, it's fine to say like our objective, our whole, we're stopping at the learning self-efficacy. We're not trying to get people to do funding. That wouldn't be and so there's a, I think there's a little bit of a difference in terms of the strategy bit of having that goal at the end of the train that mm -hmm. might be a little different in the communication space. Okay. Okay, we'll go to Todd. And then I see a couple more questions popping up and they're probably good ones to cover together. So over to you, Todd, to add to this discussion and then some more questions. Thanks, John. Okay, uh, one second while I share my screen. All right. Well, uh, it's great to be here uh, with everyone. And uh, thank you again, Brooke and Rick for uh, starting this conversation and including the, uh, our team in this project um, and to everyone else, again, on the Cavalry and DOE side. Um, so I'm presenting on behalf of our research team at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, a number of collaborators as part of our uh, research team here in the Department of Life Sciences Communication. Um, and as, as to, to kind of supplement what, what John talked about, we went much more broad in what we know about public opinion when it comes to basic science uh, research and funding. And then 
looking not necessarily at the science communication journals, but looking more at the, the STEM journals more broadly to see A, is public engagement even being talked about or discussed in these journals? And B, to what extent does basic science come up or at least research with it within the basic science fields that we uh, discussed? So to set this stage, I thought this was an interesting, this was an interesting first step that we took was just to see what does the funding for basic science research look like specifically in the United States? And this was the most uh, recent uh, data that uh, we could find from 2000, fiscal year 2017 and 2018. And, and you can see overall, um, if you look at, uh, you know, the different uh, uh, governmental agencies on the, on the most left-hand uh, column, and then you can see the breakdowns between basic and applied funding and the percent changes on the far right column. And in general, it's been going up uh, for, for pretty much all, all, all agencies, uh, more or less in tandem, some maybe a little bit more uh, than, than others, but still going up nonetheless. We see, however, that right for NSF, uh, that funding has, has gone down quite a bit. Um, and for Department of Health and Human Services, right, we see a little bit of a, a, a difference in, on the applied side um, in, in terms of that change. So at least understanding this context, we get a sense of, okay, so what does the kind of landscape look like in terms of where the funding's at? And it's been, it's been constant and, and increasing. And this is during uh, the previous administration as well. So then we decided, okay, so what if we were, what if we looked more broadly at the public opinion, public opinion trends in the US on public support for basic science uh, funding? And this was a question asked, uh, you know, compiled in the science and engineering indicators uh, research, which John has been a part of, um, and, and but data compiled from, you know, general social survey, NSF surveys, University of Michigan, a, a number of different sources where they've been um, concentrated. And this question has been asked consistently over time, even if it brings no immediate benefits, scientific research that advantages the frontiers of knowledge is necessary and should be supported by federal government. And you can see on the, the, the um, y-axis is percent degree of support. And then on the x-axis from 1985 to 2018, how that's changed over time. And indeed we see this question of this, 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 this uh, uh, um, trend line of pretty consistent and strong constant support for right, basic science research, right? In the question wording itself, no immediate benefits is there, right? Very few, uh, respondents, you know, 20, less than 20% either disagree or strongly disagree with that, with that sentiment. So taking this one step further, then um, can we get a sense of the strength of that association that the public has as, you know, social scientists were interested, you know, those who indicate agree versus strongly agree, right? Those are a different set of individuals. And what we find is that really strongly agree right, is, is, is those who agree are, are driving this, right? Those who strongly agree that um, um, uh, funding should be, uh, federal government should support funding near 30%, while those who agree, you know, somewhat uh, in, the mid, in the mid 50s, those who strongly disagree, very low. So what does this say overall is that, right, but overall public sentiment or public, yeah, public, public support for basic science funding remains strong, which is a good um, kind of entry way to think about engaging on this, on this topic. But what about the public sentiment towards basic science? And this is something as we look through lots of the, uh, you know, public opinion data, especially in the US when we went through different um, uh, kind of clearinghouses of those, of those um, poll questions, has there been any questions that ask specifically, what come, how do you feel about basic science research? How do you feel about applied research, right? And there wasn't much data on that that we could find at least in secondary databases. However, there was a, a survey done um, by a, a group uh, uh, called Science Counts led by Chris Volpe that asked a question. This was in 2015, so with, it is with that caveat, but it was the only question we can find that specifically asked if you, with the term uh, basic science, uh, basic, oops, sorry, with the term basic scientific research and the term applied scientific research, what are the associations that come to mind? You have a positive, a negative, or a neutral association with these words. And this was from a representative uh, US sample. And with basic scientific research, 58% had a positive, 
uh, had a positive association, right? Only 3% had a negative association with that term, very small. With applied research, not much different. Um, pretty similar, uh, you know, positive still above 50, but neutral still a significant amount. So this, you know, begs to the, que the question, you know, what are the associations that the public has with these different terms? And do they associate between these different terms? And I think this is an ongoing question that this conference, I think, needs to uh, grapple with and think about is, you know, how does the public think about these different terms, what they mean? Um, so when we begin to think again about, so what are some correlates that we correlates that we know in terms of demographics that you know tend to influence how one might feel about support for public funding of, of basic science? And this is just a breakdown of, of education um, with that same question I presented previously. Does you know what, what does the agreement with this question look like based on level of education? And again, we see from uh, strongly agree kind of in the darkest shade to strongly disagree in the lightest. We see as you go from less education, so high school to more education graduate, those who most strongly agree that there needs to be support for basic science research are those with graduate degrees. I'm sure the majority of us in this audience today. So important to think about too with the audience and education, right? What are the different and how do those, how do those constructs of what basic science research means differ depending on level, levels of education. Finally, as a, as a final breakdown of this, uh, these, uh, uh, the final breakdown of demographics that might correlate, we looked at uh, political ideology. And again, and I should say all these, these is, this is all the same, uh, the same data set just, just broken down with these different correlates. We see going from uh, strong Democrats to strong Republicans, this question again with the y-axis measuring support of funding X access uh, the year, we see that overall, regardless of political ideology, support is quite strong for, for science funding. Um, but if you look at the strong Democrats who are the topmost left and strong Republicans who are the uh, bottom most right, we do see a, a widening of the gap between strongly agree and strongly uh, strongly agree and agree and strongly uh, disagree and disagree, meaning dem strong Democrats, right, are more likely to uh, uh, support. But we do see a closing of, of the gap uh, between strong Republicans uh, when it comes to their views towards uh, uh, this issue of funding. So the questions, you know, from this public opinion, you know, support has been Support for basic research for basic science has remained high over time in terms of in terms of government funding. We haven't seen much change. Public overall has a positive view of basic science, so it seems. But you know, what are do they understand? You know, again, when we when we when we, when we piece apart these public opinion questions, right? Does the public even know what basic science means? I mean, I think the classic example with GMOs, right? People say they're against it, but do they know what GMOs actually mean? So, what are the mental models and structures that the public has when they think about these issues is really important to think about and unpack. And then this guiding question that leads to the next stage of the analysis that I'm gonna uh, uh, talk about is how does the STEM, communicate, STEM community engage on basic science, um, right? What, 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 what do we see happening uh, in, this, in this space, uh, specifically in the peer reviewed literature? So that's where I'm going to go into uh, what I'm going to go into next, and this is very complementary to what John did. Uh, whereas John went uh, narrow, uh, we're going very broad. And what we did is we really looked across the STEM literature, and uh, uh, you'll see that we looked at many more journals than these these four. But some uh, some some context for the the kind of STEM specific journals that we looked at. And our rationale for, for focusing on this context of, of STEM journals was, uh, A, these are the leading journals within the different fields. So I'll talk a little bit more about the fields that we looked at, uh, but also, you know, can we find any indication, A, that public engagement scholarship at all is appearing in these journals? Um, and B, how much of that that is focused on public engagement has a basic science component to it? Um, and so we really did a large scale uh, uh, review of that. 
And so, as I mentioned, right, we, we, our, our approach was this large scale analysis of the STEM peer reviewed literature. Um, you know, and then I'll talk about, the, you know, how, 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 how easy or difficult was it to, for us to uh, uh, define, and John talked about the keyword uh, uh, approach, and I'll talk a little bit about uh, ours. And uh, the approach we took, uh, thanks to uh, the, um, the uh, expertise of uh, some computational researchers on our team, was to do a large scale computational analysis, trying to cast the widest net of possible of journals and seeing does anything uh, fall into our our, um, our our approach. And so defining these concepts, right? First is public engagement. And we've had a number of conversations and I'm sure many of the many of those on this call have had is how do you define public engagement? And that you know could be a whole uh, you know 45 minute uh, lecture in and of itself. But for us, we took an approach based off of this idea that it's really about this, this process and initiative. So this deliberate, right, focus on enabling public participation in, you know, in this case, focused around um, innovation and development of new technologies, but really any part of the, of the research process. And this figure, which comes from a recent article by uh, my colleagues on this, uh, my colleagues on this grant, Dominique Brossard and Dietram Schleifle, thinking about this idea of goals, which John talked about, um, in, in his presentation, but also principles uh, and modalities. Where is this, where is this uh, um, engagement occurring? And so you'll, I, I put this, um, this figure up because it guides a little bit about how we uh, built our key search terms for our stream. And then there's the question of defining basic science. And as, as Brooks said, it's easier sometimes to uh, think about what it's not. Um, I always think of it as it's, you know, uh, we know it kind of when we see it, but we can't, <laughs> we can't define it. Uh, so what we did is in kind of this step is looking to see how the different governmental agencies uh, define basic science and went to all of their web pages and tried to find the definitions that exist. And so NSF has this working, has this definition about experimental or theoretical work to acquire new knowledge. Uh, right, this was from uh, the Department of uh, Defense, and then from the DOE, and you can get a sense, and, and for, our, for our purposes, you know, we were thinking, well, is there a way that we can create some kind of computational uh, uh, mechanism, like an algorithm or a search string, from what we can find of frequently occurring keywords that, you know, have to do with basic science, and develop that. And it turns out, right, words that come up frequently like experimental or theoretical or new knowledge, right, returns a lot of false positives. And I'll, I'll go into that uh, in, to, to a more, to a greater extent. So the actual analysis, uh, uh, what do we do? And, and for this, this approach, uh, we use the web of science, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, which is a, a database that contains uh, academic articles, peer reviewed articles, mainly in the STEM sciences and uh, our, our my computational colleagues on the team were able to essentially connect to their uh, their database and download specific articles uh, that fell into uh, focus areas that web of science um, has on their platform and so the focus areas that we uh, uh, centered on was astronomy and astrophysics chemistry neuroscience nanoscience and psychology and why do we choose these fields? Well, A, many of these fields are what uh, centers, are what the, the fields that DOE centers on and in Cavley, many of their research institute centers. Yes, there are more fields we could look at, but these are the ones we looked at specifically. We also wanted to include just for comparison's sake, uh, one of these fields that is, you know, kind of straddles the social sciences and STEM, right? Psychology, it is a STEM field, but it does deal strongly with human behavior. So do we see differences in what pops up in a journal like that compared to others? And then this is what the poll found. And so across these different um, fields, there was, uh, you could see the number of journals from each of these different fields that we selected. Uh, so a total of uh, 2,100 different journals we looked at. And then the total number of article abstracts collected was 1.5, Million. And so we collected the, the, the metadata we can collect from each article is the abstract, 
the title, the keywords, the authors, things like that. We didn't have full papers, but we had that information. So our unit of analysis, right, was the abstract and title. And I'll talk a little bit more about that um, and, and how we went into that. So then the search string development, as I mentioned, we had many iterations of, of how we can think about developing a search string for basic science, which uh, became somewhat uh, of a dead end. And we decided it would be better to do manually because again, something we intuitively know, but difficult right, to define with this approach. But public engagement, something that we have uh, more uh, familiarity with as, as science communication researchers and have literature that we can use to build off of to think about these different uh, uh, keywords um, and, and build an approach. So I wanna just briefly talk about the search string development that we use. And so there's, there's different categories that we focused on. And the first was this notion of communication process. So we had keywords that you can see here that really fell into this idea of, right, this is the exchange that, that appears between different groups. And for each of these different keywords, we had all the uh, permutations that exist for the keywords. Um, so it there would be no um, uh, permutations that didn't get picked up. Next is the communication modality. Where does the engagement occur? Meeting, town hall, right? Many of these that come up frequently in the, in the public engagement science communication uh, literature. And then the audience, right? Is it, is it general public? Is it uh, students? Is it politicians, uh, right? Is there, is, do we see specific audiences uh, that come up? And then key phrases related, related to public engagement. And so uh, these are some key terms that you know, kind of going through the literature uh, we, we came up with and ones that really were, were specific to what we wanted to focus on. And so we had, a, a, I won't go into the details about how the um, kind of automated, the search string was automated, but essentially the, the, the search string looked for pairs of how these words co-occur uh, or if they occur at all, and then flagged whether or not uh, that fell into our, our search criteria. And if, people are interested, I'm happy to talk more about that and we will have more information on that approach um, if you are interested. So the keywords that we use. So then we applied this uh, keyword based um, search string, right, to that 1.5 million articles. And we're basically testing at this point, does public engagement come up? If so, how much does it come up at all? And our findings uh, were pretty dismal. Uh, we found in across the different journals, less than you know 0.01% or less uh, articles even hit on the public engagement keywords that we put into our search algorithm. Interestingly, nanoscience didn't come up with, with many, at least within the journals that Web of Science classifies them with, although right, nanoscience, some of the nanoscience work appears in, in some of the other, other journals as well, so there is some uh, confounding there. Psychology, right, picked up a lot, 67%. As a, as a field focused on human behavior, right, it, a lot of the um, keywords obviously hit that. So this 22,000 articles that even seem to hit at the keywords, and this is a, even going into what was a false positive, which comes up a lot when you're doing keyword-based searches. We then were like, okay, so can we manually code 22,000 thousand articles to see does basic science research uh, appear as a topic or not and, and it's it's too much so but we did our, our 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 rationale was that okay well if if in the title these key words or key phrases appear in some order in some way we could at least you know manually code 700 of these articles and see if you know there is a public engagement context uh there and if if, if it, it doesn't return a false positive is the focus on basic science research. And so what we found is, you know, only 30% of those 700 articles uh, were actually within, uh, had, any, had any kind of clear focus on public engagement. The other 70% were more or less, were, were false positives, um, you know, talking about uh, consensus conferences, right? Just the terms being used in a way that uh, didn't, have anything to do with, with our interests. Um, and only 43 of those articles we could say actually touched on public engagement as the way we think about it conceptually 
um, of those 700 articles, right, 43 uh, did that, um, and then had some basic science component. And just to give you an idea of what we found is the majority of the articles that we found within those 43 came from the field of chemistry. The Journal of Chemical Education had uh, close to 15 of those articles that were focused really on these core principles of these basic science concepts of, you know, but of, of really understanding process, really understanding um, uh, engagement in this context. Yet, we didn't see much uh, outside of that. And the majority of these uh, articles focused on educational context, focused on um, informal science learning. And again, I think to John's point, we didn't see a lot uh, focused on that two-way engagement, uh, which I, I wanna touch upon briefly. So moving forward and kind of wrapping this up, what did we find is there may be a lack of public engagement literature in STEM journals uh, lack of public engagement specifically in STEM journals, uh, but definitely on basic science uh, uh, as well. But it may exist outside of peer review literature. And this is, I think, one of the, the key questions about this is, so where does the work that's happening on basic science peer? Uh, and, 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 and if so, right, to what extent are they building on the scholarship that exists in this, in this space? And I think uh, there's evidence that uh, that is not necessarily uh, the case. So questions about how to link those two is very important. And then this, this notion of what the social science uh, evidence suggests. And you know, I think to what John found about this idea that much of what the, the public engagement around basic science is getting at, and even about, about this, this uh, the, the studies we found, is that it does get to these notions of knowledge deficit, of, of, of understanding how the process of science works. And, and is this something that's being that, like, like how do we think about that strategically in that, you know, is this getting into kind of knowledge deficit uh, way of thinking? If we are trying to communicate about process of science, um, who is the audience that's gonna be attentive to that and why? And I think, Part of this is understanding and meeting where the public is. And this is research my colleagues and I have been doing for some time, but I just think it's really important to point out, you know, scientists, we, we ask scientists, what do you, and the members of the public, what do you feel when you hear the word science? And scientists overwhelmingly are more likely to have these emotions of joy and excitement, right? The process of science, wanting to explain that process of science. But the public, as you can see, are much more likely to score on hope. So the x-axis measures hope, y-axis measures joy and excitement. So is the goal then for the scientists to communicate to the public joy and excitement and get them to see science the way they do or understanding how hope, and while hope does have this applied connotation, how do you think about it within a basic science and, and, and understanding that, that, that the principles behind it about what much of this, this conference and this endeavor is about, how can that be leveraged to understanding this idea that, right, it's not just scientists that are trying to change the public's mind, but how the public also change how scientists do their science, which I think is a question that we've, we've talked about and it's come up a lot. And one of those ideas that uh, I think brings a lot of, of energy to this conversation. And then, right, kind of building off of that, and I think John has really hit on this a lot, are the, are the goals um, argument, um, you know, if you are gonna be engaged, if you are gonna have public engagement in basic science research, what, you know, what is the public's right to have and what, what, what should be the public's input on right, how that affects the scientific process that's going on? Um, how, how does the science, how does basic scientists see right, public engagement within the different stages of the scientific process uh, playing a part? So I know uh, a lot there uh, covered and, um, Look forward, that's all we got, and look forward to your um, questions. Thanks. Thank you, Todd. And thank you again, John. Lots of good thoughts and questions in the chat. And I know we're short on time. And again, our goal here today was to go deep in this so that those of us, as we get to the conference next week, can have this background. So, um, do look to next week to go deep in these things. Um, I think we've got time to cover one of the threads that's come up multiple times here. Um, I'm just gonna share really quickly for those of, those of you joining a few, a few key themes because they will be touched on and there will be brainstorming space next week to cover these. 
um, about really how we're defining basic science and are we leaving things out by the terms we're using or are people who are writing about this not including the term basic science. Um, some questions about whether or not attitudes about basic science have changed post COVID the survey data you shared Todd uh, was largely pre COVID. Um, some discussion about uh, what's being left out of some of the analysis you did when you noted consensus conferences don't count um, some discussion that maybe they do maybe people engage in consensus conferences or are we being too limiting on that. And also um, some discussion about um, we're talking about whether or not there's a distinction between basic and applied and what that distinction is in public um, connection views. But uh, someone posed a question, does that distinction even matter? Have we looked at that? So that's something interesting to look at. So I just wanna go back to that first question in the, past, in the last two minutes, because um, it's really underpinning all of this in terms of, are we leaving things out by the terms we're searching for? And are people perhaps writing about and publishing about basic science, but they never thought to use the term basic science in what they're doing so that it hasn't come up in your search? I think that there was a bit of surprise about how low some of those numbers are. So maybe um, John and Todd, if you can say a bit about uh, definitions, terms, what that might include and what might, that might we might be leaving out. Um, and that, I think that'd be as, get us in a great foundation for entering conversations next week. Yeah, I mean, I, and it, it's a great opportunity. Something I really meant to say more clearly on the final slide was um, the basic science, I agree that the basic science distinction is a bit artificial, but I also still encounter basic scientists who are trying to figure out what to do or are doing things where I'm not, it's not clear what the what the ultimate end goal is. And so it ends up being a one-off thing and it's hard for them to sort of justify. And so I do think there's some important bit there. In terms of leaving stuff out by focusing only on basic science, that's also key to this, which is the reason that I think emphasize tactics, objectives, goals, but more broadly, the idea of thinking about what are the core constructs that we're interested in is once we know what we're trying to do, if I know that I'm trying to if I decide, you know, our goal is to make sure we have robust funding, I can now go across the social sciences, the humanities, history, and look for discussions about what ensures funding support. I don't have to just look at basic science research. And so there's an artificial question. So, so what, what I would never want someone to do is say, well, I, I'm only, I'm interested in neuroscience communication, so I'm only going to read articles about neuroscience communication. That would be a terrible choice. And so, yeah, and so, yeah, by artificially focusing on basic science articles, we are saying, yeah, there's nothing on basic science and you could build that up. But also we're saying, if you're doing basic mm -hmm. science communication, if you think about your goals and then prioritize objectives, that opens a whole world of, of social science and humanities research to you. Great, Todd, last thoughts from you and then we need to wrap. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree that it's, you know, We've tried. There's 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 limitations with any any search string you create um, in any way, especially when you're doing something automated like this. Um, with the terms not coming up, the question is then, right? How do you how do you begin to unpack and, and code, right, in a way that you know as a, as a tool that we, we social scientists use to go through large uh, numbers of, uh, of of information, an effective way to determine whether or not it is focused on these concepts. And maybe, maybe you know, the, the, the focus of, you know, us continuing to think about it as basic or, or fundamental or discovery has, has tainted how we, you know, continue to define this. And maybe there are different ways and more constructive ways to define this and a scope for it. And, you know, I, I think that's, um, you know, what I'm looking for, one of the things I'm looking forward to, to learning from this conference is, is ways to go about that in and in a, in, in working in a more systemic, systematic way to do it. Mm -hmm. I'm reminded by my peers and colleagues that we actually scheduled this to 15 past the hour. My apologies. <laughs> I was also getting a reminder saying we needed to wrap. So uh, that was some poor facilitation on my part, but I'm excited we do have 15 more minutes to dive into this. Um, let's dig into um, some of these other questions and put some of your additional questions in, into the chat here. Um, I, I would love to hear your thoughts on um, uh, Todd, really quickly, um, because I think you track this, uh, has anything changed post COVID in terms of public opinion about basic science? Do you have thoughts about that? Well, 
Well, there, there isn't any uh, data that exists, but I can say from the data that I have seen that's looked at, you know, we've been tracking this, how do you feel about science question? And those numbers haven't really changed much post COVID, but the, but the, but the thing, and, and, you know, I agree these, you know, I was like, should I put this 2015 data in there? Cause it is mm -hmm. post COVID. But then again, it's the only measure I can find that even looks at this concept that Maybe, you know, my, I have a strong intuition that this is probably something more salient on the public's mind. Is this, you know, what's been going into the vaccine, how that process has come out, right? I'm sure political ideology begins to play a part in that. And maybe, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if there was differences um, in this. I mean, I think what's one of the interesting things, which, you know, you can't go into everything on this topic, but when you really get into these, 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 the, 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 the funding and about how the public thinks about funding, you know, it's the same picture that's painted with science. Everybody right, has a strong support of science, support of funding, but then you begin to tease out all these different factors that might influence that. Where's the funding come from? Is it publicly funded? Is it private funded? That's when you begin to see these differences emerge between where you place yourself on the political ideological scale. So in, in short, yes, I'm sure these have changed. The question is how, and you know, I think a lot of this is qualitative research, not quantitative research that needs to be done on how the public creates their mental schema, creates which is the mindset of right, the different mm -hmm. constructs they have around science and, and what they think of when they hear the terms basic science or where they hear the terms applied research, um, mm -hmm. which there's few, few data on. Yeah. John, do you have anything to add to that? No, I mean, I think it's been so stable for so long, I'd be surprised if there's a big jump. Um, we'll see when we get the new GSS data whenever that comes out, um, but I'd be surprised if there's a big jump. Okay, I'd love to hear your thoughts about this really rich conversation happening um, around whether or not the distinction between basic and applied really matters. Um, and what do you see in the literature about that that can shed any light? I think this will probably be a really interesting conversation we'll have at the conference next week. It's such a gray area between when basic becomes applied. Um, do people need to care about the difference between basic and applied research? What are your thoughts on that? And whether it matters by audience, that's the question. I mean, are there some audiences for whom that's really critical mm -hmm. and some audiences for whom the general public maybe that that doesn't matter at all? Mm -hmm. So I could, if I could just take that uh, quickly. Um, yeah, it's like, do, does, you know, thinking about it in terms of these distinctions matter more about like, what is the, what is the, the, the audience you're communicating with and what they what might they be more perceptive to. And I think to Rick's point, right, those who are highly, um, right, who are, are already highly engaged with science, you do have strong interest and curiosity in science, they're going to be very receptive, right, to I think a lot of the goals that when you think about basic science research, um, come up when it is about, you know, whether it's kind of getting this new pipeline of scientists, uh, you know, creating excitement. Um, but again, it's like, it, it, I, I think the question is, um, how, 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 how is that goal? How are, you, how are you thinking about that goal strategically? And I think oftentimes, right, for a lot of members of the public, uh, it is the application that matters, right? The application does matter, but how can you use Right, that 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 curiosity, interest, um, context as a way to bring that audience into a picture, or at least a way to capture their attention if they if 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 they are focused on maybe an applied uh, an applied concept. So I, part of me thinks too, like how do you how can you leverage both in a, in a strategic way, not just one. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so on, so on Rick's question about audience, does it matter by audience? I say it matters by goals, but goals are audience specific, right? So that if I'm trying to get a policymakers to ensure robust funding for basic science, then I need to make sure that they perceive the benefits of that are greater than the risks that they think is normatively acceptable for their peer group, that they think it's going to have a positive, that it's um, something that they're able to do, right? Self-advocacy also need to think, they need to believe that scientists are have integrity, are competent, and so, but then I need to do research to find out, do they really believe those things, right? And so I think in terms of goal, audience specific goals rather than just audiences. But then the bigger question about the scientists, I also think that I've been finding in some of my other work that there are a lot of scientists who have 
their basic research stuff, but then they also have some applied projects. No, very few scientists have one thing, right? They're doing multiple different things. And, and um, related to that is this idea, if we're really serious about two-way engagement, which means scientists changing how they behave and how they, what they think, feel, that means that they need to be open to changing their behavior. Like maybe that means doing their research differently. Maybe it means choosing different research tasks, which, which I found is that sometimes those things tend to be the basic science projects. So there's these, these or the, sorry, the applied projects. So these basic scientists start interacting with stakeholders, get to know stakeholders, and they hear a really interesting question. They're like, yeah, we should do that. I should, we should look into that. And they do. And so even with an individual scientists, I think um, there's a distinction that matters in terms of, and then scientists, individual scientists know, like, no, this is just sort of stuff we're trying to do to figure out what's going on inside that cell. And they're like, but you know, I'm also doing this other project, which we can figure out what that actually means for, for land managers, what that means for. And so mm -hmm. I both think that the, the distinction matters and it doesn't. Um, okay, uh, I, I wanna acknowledge a really good question um, that we'll talk about next week, but there is a question from Catherine about social conditions that support curiosity. That is a really good question that came up in our um, pre-conference planning. We actually have plenary session devoted to curiosity around the social science of understanding what curiosity is and then discussions about, about exactly that. I think it'll be a really good session. Um, so let's save th those questions for next week. Um, on the landscape studies and what we're thinking about in terms of basic science. Um, another question that's come up is while you looked at whether or not there was literature about basic science specifically, do you think we could look at the existing literature that maybe isn't specifically about basic science, but is either generally about engagement or um, specific about applied science and could we posit what of that is relevant to basic science, which is more than just a literature review, but is that something that we could consider or something that we should better understand? Or is that distinction again, not matter, like some folks have asked, which I think is really interesting. Not, not to, I guess I feel like I'm repeating myself a little bit, but the goal, <laughs> like the goals thing, right? Like if, yes, you should absolutely use the whole body of social science and humanities literature. And you can do that if you know what you're trying to accomplish, um, right? So something like curiosity, curiosity is great. I'm all for encouraging curiosity, but I would still say, well, what do you think will happen if we make people more curious? What do you think that will lead to? Is a curiosity an end into itself? Or do we think that making people curious will make them search for more information and they'll search for more information and then they'll make better personal decisions? I mean, right, so it's a, what's, why do we, and so, uh, Yes, we should absolutely go across the social science literature and we should do that. But there are gonna be goals that are unique to basic scientists that applied researchers are gonna be more into. Like they wanna know, how do I get policymakers to consider this policy? Whereas an applied researcher might say, well, how do I ensure a strong relationship between science and society more generally, not on any specific thing? And so I think there are gonna be things that basic scientists are more, are more like goals that they're more likely to prioritize. Todd, anything to add? Uh, I don't know. I mean, not. I, I, I guess just one of the, and this doesn't directly <laughs> trust the question, but I think it's just, you know, something that 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 I've been thinking a lot about from from the the time that I've invested in, in thinking about this topic and thinking about the trends that have been going on with the data, and and I think just something important for to think about collectively, at least within the context of the US is this idea that the public, the public doesn't understand the distinction between basic science and, 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 and applied science research very much. We see trends indicating that, right, there is high support for basic scientific research funding, right? The, the funding has been going up. I think if the public does, and, and I think this is why understanding how you think about engagement within these contexts is so important, the public has a much more a uh, clear idea of what goes on in basic science research has a much more clear idea about, right, uh, 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 that, right, I mean, basic science research doesn't always have intended results. What, how do, how do we think about, well, what if the public then is like, well, maybe I don't support basic science research as much. And I think that's where there's a lot of questions that come in about this idea of what is the strategy and the goals uh, you know, the things John's have been talking about that we use when, when if we do begin to do more, more research on, right, 
unpacking these, these distinctions and understanding them, what the potential uh, drawbacks could be and where the opportunities exist. And I think um, it's just something I've been thinking a lot about. Uh, and, you know, I, 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 I hope to have more discussions about it. Okay, a very specific question, and then I'm going to close this out um, with a final thought from each of you. Um, Spiros asked a question about, you talked a lot about the articles, but who's writing these papers? Um, are they written uh, by basic scientists who are engaging? Are they written by science communication scholars? Who are the, who's authoring these papers that are coming out in your analysis? I can talk a little bit about it. So, um, in like in astronomy, there's like a group of folks uh, in Harvard that write a ton of the heart, the astronomy empirical data. There's a, in neuroscience, it's a little more broad. Um, yeah, there's a lot of one-offs. I mean, I think there's a, there's a ton of one-off stuff. There's a few, I mean, you know, you can go in, if you're, people who are interested in this have access to web of science, you can go in and put in public engagement and it'll give you the author lists for who, who does that. And there are, I mean, it turns out people, I work with people Todd work with tend to be and, and are high on that list, but then yeah, there's a lot of people sort of the long tail of, of, of one and two, two uses of the term. Yeah, I think, I mean, to add to that in, in, in ours too, I mean, it seemed like it was mainly um, so basic science researchers or, or, or scientists that are, are doing these. And, and occasionally you see maybe someone in education, like I think with chemical education, you know, that came up a lot just because they had someone on that was an education expert. Um, but, you know, in terms of, in terms of more than that, um, it didn't seem like there was, uh, that there was a clear pattern of, um, you know, these papers coming with authors that, uh, kind of focused on science communication or engagement. Mm -hmm. um, but, but I, you know, the other interesting thing too, is we, you know, we, we looked at funding too, and, and, it, and, and we, I didn't go into it in detail here, but, you know, the funding pattern is interesting too. Um, and, you know, there, and I think, I think what we found is that, you know, so much of this is, is international and, and there is these very specific uh, grants um, you know, for specific projects. And we see a lot of that with these really kind of um, contexts of, 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 um, of doing public engagement. And I mean, I think, you know, that's kind of a whole endeavor in and of itself is like, you know, mapping on, you know, these, these, different, these different major grants and, and, and seeing how that, you know, plays into these push for funding uh, on, on different public engagement uh, topics. Um, but in general, I guess to the point, um, yeah, there wasn't a lot of, uh, of SciComm uh, research or, or social science research connected to it. Okay. Thank you both. We need to close. Um, we have so many topics that have come up here today that will be so rich to discuss next week. So thank you everyone that joined. I see that we have we had about 100 people with us today. Like Rick said, we expect about 1,700 with us next week. We are working hard to make sure we design our conference next week with lots of spaces for brainstorming, networking, discussion, even with that many people. So we look forward to you participating and sharing your thoughts and moving this whole body of thinking forward. And thank you, John and Todd, for your hard work to move this forward and provide such a strong foundation for us.